if they had done that, if Lou Channel kills them, would they have been better off or would have it just been business as usual? So there's your opportunity uh, to sort of dive even deeper into it if you want. Uh, it's just something I've thought about for a lot uh, and how one misstep and there's a huge domino effect. Something to think about. Anyway, well, we do part four of the Genovese crime family history. So uh, we know Luciano's gone. Cuba's going to have some issues soon enough. Uh, Costello is in full charge of the family with Willie Moretti serving as, as his underboss. Uh, Genovese at this point is essentially on standby uh, and would have a few problems at home, so to speak. Uh, Genovese, who had been sort of basically rele- relegated to, to a captain, uh, was handed the Greenwich Village crew. Uh, which he came up under, the same crew uh, that Vincent the Chingigante would eventually take over. Uh, Genovese essentially ran that crew from 1920 to about 1931 or two, and he would end up, you know, obviously taking off to Italy. And when he comes back from Italy, he ends up taking over the crew again in 1944. Uh, January 5th of 1950, Senator Estes Kefauver, a Democratic senator from Tennessee, would introduce a re, uh, excuse me a resolution that would allow the Senate Committee on the Judiciary to investigate organized crime's role in interstate commerce. Uh, and this really came about due to overwhelming articles that were showing up in newspapers and magazines that were published about the mafia, uh, both sort of controlling political, state, and local corruption cases. Uh, which led to interstate commerce and how it put the American economy in the foothold of criminals, which the American government didn't want. Uh, These articles discussed how the alleged mob was controlling political processes. Uh, And these articles, like I said, were all over the place, which is what led to this shit show that we're about to talk about. Uh, The Senate Committee on Interstate and Foreign Commerce uh, had already claimed jurisdiction over the issue before Estes Kefauver got involved. And what ends up happening is there's a compromise resolution that was substituted, which established a special committee of five senators, senators whose membership would be drawn from both the Judiciary and the Commerce Committee. Debate over the substitute resolution was a really a nasty fucking argument, uh, but it was partisan. Uh, and voting on the resolution was extremely close. It almost didn't pass. On May 3rd of 1960, Vice President Albin Barkley, uh, who was actually uh, the President of the United States, he was basically the leader of the United States Senate, would cast the uh, role for the tie-breaking vote, and the Special Committee to Investigate Crime and Interstate Commerce would be established immediately. Uh, Barkley, as president of the Senate, was empowered to choose the committee's members, and he would choose Estes Kefauver, Herbert O'Connor out of Maryland, Lester Hunt out of Wyoming. What the fuck do they know about anything in Wyoming except killing cows and molesting sheep? Uh, Alexander Wiley from Wisconsin and Charles Toby from New Hampshire. Uh, The Kefauver Committee held hearings in 14 major cities across the United States. More than 600 witnesses would testify. Uh, Many of the committee's hearings were televised on live national television. Uh, It was, excuse me, televised on national television to large audiences, providing many Americans with their first glimpse into organized crime's influence in the United States. Among the more notorious people (laughs) who appeared before the committee were uh, Tony Accardo, uh, Louis Campagna, Mickey Cohen, Willie Moretti, Frank Costello, Jake Guzik, Meyer Lansky, Paul Rica, uh, Virginia Hill, Joe Adonis, uh, and Benjamin uh, Siegel's girlfriend, Virginia Hill, which I think I just mentioned. Uh, Irish mob guys, Enoch Johnson, uh, former policeman in Atlantic City. So anyway, Kefauver becomes a nationally recognized figure because of this, and the committee enabled him to end up running for the presidency of the United States in 1952 and 56, and he failed miserably. Fuck him anyway. Uh, But he would become the party's uh, vice president nominee in 56. Uh, Many of the Kefauver committee's hearings were aimed at proving that a Sicilian organized crime organization based on strong family ties, centrally controlled uh, a vast organized crime conspiracy in the United States, but the committee never came close to justifying that bullshit claim. Uh, rather, the committee uncovered extensive evidence that people of all nationalities, ethnicities, and even religious views operated locally 
and controlled, loosely organized crime syndicates on the local level. So it wasn't just Italians, but this is what they were going to hammer in on. Uh, the committee's final report, which was issued on April 17th of 1951, included 22 recommendations for the federal government and seven recommendations for state and local authorities. Among its recommendations were the creation of the fucking racket squad uh, within the United States Department of Injustice. <laughs> Uh, the establishment of permanent crime commission at the federal level, the expansion uh, of the jurisdiction of the judiciary committee to include interstate organized crime and a request that the justice department investigate and prosecute 33 named individuals as suspected leaders of organized crime in the United States. So without any evidence, without any proof, here we go with the persecution. It's like the fucking McCarthy hearings all over again. So, what ends up making this situation even fucking worse is if it could get worse uh, was J. Edgar Hoover finally admits that a national organized crime syndicate did exist and that the FBI had known about it for a long time and had done really nothing about it. Uh, legislative proposals and state ballot referendums uh, legalizing gambling, gambling because at the time they were trying to legal, legitimize gambling and all of a sudden that's not going to happen now because of all of this nonsense about organized crimes involvement in gambling industry and more than 70 crime commissions were established at the state and local level to build the Kafafer committee's work. Uh, the Kafafer committee was the first committee to suggest that civil law be expanded and used to combat organized crime. Uh, Congress would respond to that issue and in 1970, passed the Kafafer, uh, excuse me, the fucking RICO Act uh, as it uh, as a direct direct response to the committee's recommendation. And we can think we can thank that cocksucker William uh, was it William F. Blakely for that nonsense. Uh, anyway, uh, the hearings were really bad for the guys. Uh, most refused to answer a single question, and they would defer and invoke their Fifth Amendment rights. Uh, and really, it was just a complete ball-busting affair. The mafia had kept Hoover in check for years with blackmail. Uh, but Hoover would end up dropping the ball under a lot of immense pressure. Uh, probably the fact that there were those in the Senate that were threatening J. Edgar Hoover to unleash photos of him, uh, which the mafia had used against him for years. This was probably something that happened to him. He had really no other choice uh, at the time. Uh, a few years later, Joe Valachi would completely level the mafia in ways still to this day that shock people. Uh, while most mobsters played the sort of the question game, one person in particular sort of began to scare the mob guys, and that was Willie Moretti. Uh, while Moretti had been a steady heavyweight, a killer, and an earner for the mob, uh, and an underboss, specifically the Luciano crime family, uh, while most other people took the Fifth Amendment, refusing to incriminate themselves, uh, Willie Moretti sort of opens his mouth in the wrong way. Now, whether or not he was trying to be a clown or a comedian, it wasn't going to help him. Uh, he was getting a little loose. Uh, in one of the sessions during a meeting, he was asked uh, if he was in the mafia and for how long. Moretti, instead of taking the fifth replies, like, do I have a fucking membership card that says mafia on it? People in the audience begin to laugh. Then he gets asked how he operated politically speaking, to which he would reply, uh, I, don't op I don't operate politically, and if I did, I'd be a fucking congressman by now, which led to more laughter. It was a move that the mafia didn't find very funny. Uh, there had been sort of a, a, a sort of a downdraft message in the mob to shut the fuck up, don't say nothing, and I guess Moretti's way of dealing with the stress was to make fun of it. Uh, but it ended up making other bosses irate, including Frank Costello. Uh, Moretti had been suffering, obviously. The, he had syphilis, and, you know, whether or not the mob used this to her advantage, I think that they did, but he had syphilis, and there were complications. And the mafia kind of looked at this as, well, fuck, if he's saying this shit, what's to stop him from saying something even more fucking stupid? Uh, and so there was a, a, a big conversation about what to do with him. And Frank Costello actually stood up and, and just, you know, uh, didn't want to. He voted no, uh, but the commission outvoted him, and there was no other choice. Uh, according to sources, uh, Vito Genovese openly talked to other people about killing Moretti, and Genovese, uh, 
even was on record as saying, may the Lord have, may the Lord have mercy on his soul because he's fucking sick. He's losing his fucking mind. We got to do this guy a favor. So on October, October 4th, 1951, William Moretti was holding court with four others at Joe's Elbow Room Restaurant at Cliffside Park, New Jersey at 11.28 a.m. The staff at the restaurant hears multiple gunshots fired from the dining room area. They end up entering the dining room area, and they see Willie Moretti flat on his back, shot in the face and the head, which many over the years had said that was a sign of respect because at least this way he was going to get killed. He knew who did it. They were respectful and didn't shoot him basically in the back. Uh uh, where am I? Okay. Uh, and there's something very interesting about this is that Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis uh, were supposed to be at that, that luncheon with Willie Moretti. But Jerry Lewis suddenly came down with the fucking mumps like an hour before they were supposed to be there, which has led many to believe that Jerry Lewis was likely tipped off that there was going to be some shit going down there and he shouldn't go. In either case, uh, this was a move by Genovese, uh, that would have loved to have hear. He would have loved to have uh, hear about that. Um, all right, so Willie Moretti is dead, and Genovese ends up getting elevated to or as official underboss. Uh, he's one step away from his goal, but as I said, he would have some issues at home. Uh, Vito Genovese, by nature, was a fucking nut. Uh, his wife, Anna, who had a husband when Genovese first met her, uh, Genovese wanted to be with her so badly, he ended up having her husband thrown off a fucking building and then would marry her some 10 days later. So, if Vito wants your your woman, <laughs> he's going to throw you off the fucking building to get it. Uh, and over the years, Anna had gotten fed up with Vito, and she ends up filing for spousal support in court. Uh, it was enough to drive him absolutely fucking batshit crazy, but he refused. And then she upped the anti, by, excuse me, upped the ante to put pressure on him by telling the judge that he was in the mafia, uh, she would tell the judge about his rackets, and then she requested the house and $350 a week and a quick divorce. Vito would counter sue on the grounds that she deserted him. In response, she would get even more vindictive, and she would tell the judge that Vito ra ran the illegal lottery rackets in Jersey and in New York, making over $1 million a month per year, or excuse me, $1 million per year, that he owned four nightclubs in Manhattan, he owned a dog track in Virginia, and a dozen or so other legit businesses. Uh, in 1954, those claims ultimately would be thrown out of court, but not, but not before Gen Vito Genovese reacted in the usual Vito fashion. Uh, somebody was going to have to pay uh, because Vito just didn't let shit go. So when Vito took off to Italy to, to sort of escape the murder indictment, he ends up putting a guy by the name of Stephen Franz in charge of watching over his wife. His job was simple. Just make sure she wanted for nothing. And when Vito returned, he had heard that Anna was basically banging everybody in town. <clears throat> with that not, excuse me, with that knowledge and now her persistent slander and her money grabbing ways as the sort of the way he sees it, somebody's going to have to pay. And that person would have been Stephen Franz, who Vito blamed for the whole entire problem that he was having. Vito would send word to Joe Valachi. Valachi would then uh, meet Vito in a social club in Manhattan where Vito ordered the death of Franz. On June 18th of 53, Franz was called to a meeting at Valachi's restaurant in the Bronx. As he entered, he was caught from behind by Pasquale Pagano and Fiore Ciano, who was, the Gen who was Genovese's nephew, and basically they strangled him to death with a fucking piano wire. Uh, and Vito just didn't let shit slide for any fucking reason. So, with that issue resolved... Uh, Vito wanted specifically to move on Costello. Uh, he knew, given Costello's age, his power, his friendships, unless he made a move, he probably was not going to become boss. And he was an impatient guy. He knew that Costello had the ear of other bosses, and he knew that with his political connections, unless he used the gun, it just probably wasn't going to happen. Vito also realized, though, that Albert Anastasia, who rose to infamy by killing Vincent Mangano and his brother Philip, was the real enemy in his sights. Costello uh, had power in numbers and support. And if you remove the foundation of the house, then it crumbles. Uh, Vincent Mangano had installed Anastasia in as his underboss. This was the early form of what would become the, the excuse me, the Gambino crime family. Uh, Mangano's issue was very similar to Joe Massaria and Maranzano's with Luciano. Uh, 
you know, Mangano just didn't like his men intermingling with other men, uh, probably just because of the past and how that all sort of fleshed out for everybody else. He saw it as subversive. So he had a beef with Anastasia for doing hits for Luciano and Costello. He saw that as being unnecessary. He especially didn't like the fact that Luciano Costello didn't even have the respect to ask his permission to use Anastasia. So it was something that always rubbed him the wrong way. Anastasia always saw it as business, nothing else. Uh, they would also have business disputes, uh, Mangano and Anastasia, over money, over turf, over rackets. It would even lead to fist fights and to screaming matches. Uh, all of those things sort of combined push Anastasia into a corner. When you push a dog into a corner, what is the dog going to do? The dog is going to bite. So on April 15th of 51, Vincent, would, Vincent Mangano would disappear. It would never be found. Uh, later that day, his brother Philip was discovered floating in Jamaica Bay with four dozen stab, stab wounds. Anastasia had been serving as acting, acting boss in the Mangano crime family, but only had the underboss title. Uh, the commission was irate uh, that this happened. And they ended up calling Anastasia in for a face-to-face. -face. And basically what I'm doing here is giving you the background of how, how Albert sort of came into power. Uh, he claimed that Mangano, the, the Monganos were unjustly trying to kill him and that if he was going to act, if he decided to act, then he would only do so in self-defense. But he never admits to killing them in the meeting, which was a very important thing. Joe Bonanno ended up backing him on the commission. Uh, and a lot of people have talked over the years and said basically that, that Joe Bonato did it at least outwardly so that there wouldn't be another war. But there was deeper support there. Uh, and it was a long range plan for Joe Bonato to use Anastasia, at least in some capacity, to help Joe Bonato reach where he wanted to kind of go. Uh, Bonato was a schemer to say the least. Uh, so Anastasia, after this meeting, asked to be named official boss of the Mangano crime family, requested the name change to the Anastasia crime family, which the commission green lights. Uh, Mangley Costello backs the idea. And he and Anastasia, you know, they went way back to the early days. They were insanely close. And he knew he needed a deep ally against Genovese, who was suspected of plotting against everybody anyway. So 1956 was a big year for Vito Genovese. Uh, Vito was ready. Ready Freddy. Uh, Vito's main issue, issue, especially after Costello took Anastasia's side, he had to find a way to control his odds. Uh, Vito knew as long as Anastasia was alive, he couldn't touch Costello. Uh, if he dared, a war would ensue and Anastasia likely would go fucking apeshit in a millisecond and start killing everybody. Uh, Vito, behind the scenes, begins to cozy up to Joe Bonanno. <clears throat> uh, he knew that he needed Bonanno's help at least from the commission side of things. Bonanno, who might have been outwardly unsupportive of any action against another boss, inwardly was all about it. Uh, anything that he thought he could benefit from down the line, he would go for. Uh, he was a snake who's, who essentially stirred the drink, and in many uh, of the issues the mafia had could directly be traced right back to Joe Bonanno in some capacity. Uh, a complete fucking snake. Uh, so Genovese was getting desperate and he needed the backing of somebody within the Anastasia family. Uh, he would find that within Carlo Gambino. At the time, Gambino was the consigliere of the Anastasia crime family. Uh, the other fear that Genovese had uh, was that the bond of Anastasia and Costello, with Costello being the weaker of the two, Anastasia would take over the commission, and that meant bad news for Genovese, as he and Anastasia had already had serious beasts over turfs and rackets, specifically the docks, uh, because Genovese was encroaching into his area. Uh, so if Genovese were to take out Costello and, and Anastasia, then effectively he becomes the boss of bosses, and now he controls the fucking commission. Uh, and, and that's exactly what he wanted. Uh, and he knew that Joe Bonanno would probably fall in line. And if he didn't, he just cut his fucking head off. I mean, that was just sort of the way it went down. Uh, so what Genovese does is he approaches Carlo Gambino. He explains essentially that he wants to overthrow Costello. And if Gambino would be sort of on board with that, then Genovese would have Anastasia killed. And that would allow Gambino to take over. Uh, it was a simple... Just look away from the hit on Costello. I'll handle Anastasia, and then you can take over, and everything will be good. While the deal sounded good, at least on its fringes, to Gambino, uh, he, had, who also had his desires to take over the family himself, but he had a few concerns, and legitimate ones. The first concern was the commission and what they would say. 
uh, Gambino knew that the commission would have a serious issue with an unsanctioned hit. He suggested to Genovese that he begin assailing Anastasia's character to the commission. Uh, so put word on the street, he's a piece of shit, and put word on the street some of his character defects. Uh, he also advised Genovese that Anastasia had disrespected Meyer Lansky by demanding money from the casinos in Cuba. And when Lansky told him to get lost, what Anastasia does, he begins to build his own casinos in Cuba to rival that of Lansky. Uh, Meyer Lansky had already approached Gambino about killing Anastasia for the disrespect. Uh, and Gambino explained that if he did it that way, Lansky would be on board and the commission wouldn't have any other choice than to just fucking accept, accept it. So Gambino is playing politics here. Uh, the, the other issue that Carl Gambino had was worrying about what Neil Della Croce, who was a staunch uh, Anastasia supporter, what he might do in response. Uh, and, and more or less, Genovese sort of just says, look, you know, if Neil gets out of line, I'll have him killed. That'll take care of that. So a deal is reached and Vito goes to work. Uh, one of the first things that Vito does is he begins using Anastasia's actions against him. He brings up the murder, murder of Arnold Schuster, which we've talked about a million times on this show. And that was the guy who informed on Willie Sutton. Not only did that event bring heat and attention, which the commission didn't want, but it was a national news story. He then informed them how Anastasia was disrespecting Lansky and informed them of the actions that were going on in Cuba. The commission then sort of checks with Meyer Lansky and they verify, is this really what's going on? And he acknowledges it. Uh, there was concern that Anastasia was getting too reckless and too greedy uh, and wanted too much power. While the commission didn't make any decision either way, it was pretty much enough. Uh, there were enough signs to the commission that maybe Anastasia wasn't the right guy for the job. Maybe he was going to create problems down the line. But it was more drama and gossip to them than anything else. But it was enough to keep their eyes and ears open. Uh, I'm not sure why Costello didn't say anything to Anastasia. Maybe he did. Uh, because I'm sure that that news got back to Costello and very quickly. Uh, you know, but in the meantime, there was a succession of men that needed to be killed. Uh, in 1956, Joe Adonis ends up getting deported back to Italy. Uh, and it's really a stroke of luck for Genovese because that is another guy that Genovese was seriously fucking worried about. Uh, had Adonis not been deported, uh, it's my belief that, that Genovese probably would have moved to try to have him killed, which would have been a very fucking bad thing to do. Uh, May 2nd of 1957, Frank Costello is walking into his apartment uh, when out of the shadows steps Vinny the Chin Gigante. He raises the 45. He calls out Frank's name. Frank turns. And that turn really saves his life as the bullet rips through his fucking hat, raises his head, he falls down, and Gigante takes off thinking he's fucking dead. Fortunately, he's not. Later on, Gigante would be charged with that attempted hit, uh, and Costello would refuse to acknowledge who Gigante was, basically saving him from a life in prison sentence. Uh, the shooting at Costello was enough to make him sort of kind of realize the, the jig is up, I'm done, and he ends up stepping down his boss. The attempted murder of Costello sent Anastasia into a fucking nut nutcase rage. Uh, Joe Bonanno would end up stepping in as a buffer and just explain to Anastasia, look, it's just business. Let it fucking go. Uh, once again, we see Joe Bonanno kind of greasing himself up and putting him in the middle of a fucking fight. And he's not doing it because he gives a fuck. He's doing it because he has ulterior motives. Uh, and he explains, you know, let's not go to war with another family. And, and basically what Bonanno is doing is he's easing and baiting Anastasia to relax. Uh, Frank Scalise, who was Anastasia's underboss, is so fucking infuriated by what was uh, attempted on Frank Costello that he threatens to kill Vito Genovese. Because they all know that Genovese is behind it. He threatens to kill Genovese and Anastasia says, no, we can't have another war. So he ends up having Frank Scalise killed just so they can avoid war. Uh, that move propelled Gambino into the underboss role, and that's how Carlo got there. Now it was Gambino's turn to pull his end of the deal. October 25th of 1957, Anastasia walks into the Park Sheridan Hotel on 56th and 7th in Manhattan to get a quick shave and a haircut. Prior to arriving, his bodyguard had parked in a parking garage down the block, and he totally leaves Anastasia wide open. Uh, many have speculated that that he was definitely a part of the plan or paid off because Anastasia always parked in front of the hotel. Uh, so is Anastasia sitting in the chair with a towel over his face. Joey Gallo and Par Carmine Persico enter the shop and just start firing off rounds. 
Uh, it's been said he was hit multiple times. He ends up leaping from his chair to attack Gallo and Persico, but he's merely attempting to attack the reflection in the mirror. Uh, and Persico and Gallo fire multiple more shots. Uh, and Anastasia's done. He's fucking dead. Uh, Genovese, with that move, now has full control of his own family. He ends up renaming them the Genovese crime family. Uh, and eventually, Carlo would now succeed uh, that family uh, and would rename them the Gambino crime family. But before any of that could happen, they had to be recognized by the commission. Genovese knew without being recognized by the commission, it just wasn't it, the, the pursuit was going to be fruitless. So here's what Genovese does. Genovese would call for a meeting. Uh, and at this meeting, he would legitimize himself and propel back excuse me and he would propel and back gambino's ascension genovese sends word that he wants to hold a meeting in chicago sam giancana was reached out to and refused to host any fucking meeting as he thought that it was a bad fucking idea uh, genovese then decides to have the meeting in buffalo new york uh and he contacts uh, stefano magadino who refuses to even host it or even get involved in it and then he hands it off to joe uh, barbara who at the time was the boss of the Buffalo No Crime family, but he had suffered a heart attack in 56 and had somewhat, some, somewhat stepped down from the day-to-day -day operations, which allowed Russell Buffalino to essentially be the acting boss. Uh, he was contacted by Magadino, and then he hands the plans to Buffalino to take care of it. Uh, Joe Barber's property was chosen as the location because of its proximity to New York City and its semi-remote location. A large part of the meeting was for Genovese to name himself Boss of Bosses and for the rest of the mafia to acknowledge Carlo Gambino as the new boss of the former Anastasia crime family. Uh, gambling, narcotics, as well as the dissolution of Anastasia's rackets would be secondary topics. Uh, a hot topic would be the circumstances surrounding the Anastasia and Scalish murders uh, because the leftovers of the Anastasia crime family were absolutely fucking irate uh, and would not support Gambino as a new boss, specifically Neil Della Croce, uh, who was a Scalish and Anastasia loyalist. And they sort of wanted to prevent war, which is why this is going to be a discussion. Uh, Neil Della Croce and Armand Rava were hell-bent on going after Vito Genovese and anybody who they thought supported him. Uh, and war was really, really close to popping off. Uh, so, as the meeting began, Santos... Excuse me, Santo Traficante, Carlos Marcello, Russell Buffalino, and Frank D. Simone demanded to know what happened to Albert Anastasia. Genovese would step up. He'd explain that Anastasia was acting in partnership with Frank Costello to kill him. In addition to that, Anastasia had killed Arnold Schuster, uh, had bemoaned about casino earnings in Vegas. Uh, he was stepping on Lansky's toes, trying to take over turf in Cuba. Uh, prior to this meeting, Lansky was off, asked for his opinion uh, because he did not attend this meeting because no Jewish gangsters were invited to the meeting. Uh, but he backed up what Vito Genovese had said. Genovese was accepted as boss of his family. Uh, Gambino was asked about his role, if any, in the murder of Scalise and Anastasia. He confirmed that he didn't murder Anastasia and that what he did confirm was Scalise was murdered by Anastasia as a result for not letting the gripe go over Costello. A vote would be taken, and Gambino is named boss of the Anastasia family, and then it becomes the Gambino crime family. The final thing that was asked was how Gambino would deal with the insurgency from his, within his own family, and he more or less promised that war would not break out under any circumstances. Uh, it was enough for the other bosses to accept, uh, and it's also uh, worth noting um, that I lost my fucking place. Where was I? Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, it's worth noting that the year prior to this, there was another mafia sort of conclave, and it was held in the same fucking place that this one was about to be uh, sort of held in. Uh, the meeting continued. They discussed Cuban gambling, uh, the expansion into the Caribbean, as well as continued use of Cuba as a way station for the importation of narcotics. Uh, word was sent that a meeting in which Joe Bonanno, Carmine Galante, Frank Garofalo, Giovanni Bonaventure, as well as contacts in Detroit, Buffalo, and Montreal had met in Palermo where they bridged the gap with Sicilian mobsters to move more narcotics into Cuba. 
Uh, the Garment District was a huge discussion as the Luciano crime family, which was now the Genovese crime family, had pretty much complete control of the garment industry, and they still do today. Uh, and that other bosses wanted a part of that. They de- So they devised plans to open the bank drawer a little bit and uh, sort of, you know, let everybody uh, sort of control a little, a little piece of it. Uh, that way money could go around. Uh, and here's where things got interesting. According to law enforcement, State Trooper Edgar Croswell had become aware that Joe Barbara's son was reserving rooms in local hotels along with deliveries of large deliveries of meat and cheese and wine and all of this nonsense. Uh, according to Croswell, it was suspicious to him, and he kept a close eye on the Joe Barbara estate. As cops began to come along to see what Croswell was talking about, or at least radioing in, they saw many luxury cars and began taking down a license plate. Uh, uh, so as they called the plates in, many of the cars came back to known criminals, so they called in reinforcements and they formed a roadblock. When the boys began to see what was going on on the outside, they all took off. Many fled through the woods. Uh, and Buffalino was stopped at the roadblock with Vito Genovese and three others in a car. Buffalino allegedly tells the troopers that Barbara was sick and they were just visiting him. Uh, police would actually let them go. All those apprehended were were fined uh, $10,000 each and were given prison sentences ranging from three to five years. But all the convictions were overturned on appeal in 1960. Uh, the news was everywhere and the mob was officially put on notice. The problem that I have with this is that I don't believe for one second that some meddling state trooper found out that Joe Barbara's son was attempting to attain rooms at a nearby hotel. How do you connect rooms at a hotel to Joe Barbara's house to meat being delivered to to cars being there? It just I don't I just find all of it hard to believe. Uh, a regular beat cop maybe, but a state trooper doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I also don't believe that seeing an expensive car would warrant him to run a fucking plate. Uh, the story just doesn't make any sense from a logistical standpoint. Nothing that they were doing was illegal. And I just cannot believe that one nosy fuck could insover, uh, uncover such a huge thing. I, I just can't. However, <laughs> Joe Bonanno, on the other hand, was supposed to be there and wasn't. Uh, for some reason, Joe Bonanno didn't go. It's long been asserted that Bonanno himself called in a tip to local law enforcement. Uh, it makes sense, given that Bonanno was out of favor with other bosses. And the fact that every single uh, uh, every single mob boss was there, but Joe Bonanno wasn't. It's, it, it's just highly suspect to me and always has been. Now, you might ask, what, what would he have to gain? Well, a lot, especially if the charges stuck. Uh, some may argue, well, he didn't go because he was in the same place and he's not stupid. Come on, this is Joe Bonanno. He went to every other fucking meeting. Why would this be any different? Uh, I think that really what it was was a small power play to see if he could get rid of his enemies and it didn't work so who was at the meeting this is going to be a list of a shitload of people uh <laughs> joe barbara who was the boss of the buffalino crime family uh, russ buffalino underboss uh let's see uh, uh dominic alamayo he was a capo uh let's see angelo skiandra ignatius canone anthony uh guarini uh james ostico Pasquale uh, Terragano. Sorry, the font's fucking small in this thing. Uh, Manny Zaccari. Uh, Salvatore Travellino. Pasquale uh, Monacino. Pasquale Schiertino. Guy Pasquale. Uh, Mo- Morris Madugno. Now, here's what's interesting about Morris Madugno. I don't know him, but I know somebody else. My father was very close with the Madugno's. Uh, a lot of them. So I, maybe someday I'll share some stories about the Madugno brothers. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bart Gucci, Giovanni Bonaventure, Anthony Reyna, uh, Joe Diamonds, Evola, Vito Genovese, uh, Jerry Catania, uh, Mike Miranda, Salvatore Cheri, uh, Carlo Gambino, uh, Staten Island Joe Riccobono, Big Paul Castellano, Carmine the fucking Dr. Lombarzi. Uh, Lombardazzi, let's see, uh, Armand Simonetti, uh, Vincent Rao, John Ornamento, Joe Rosato, Joe Profacci, uh, Joe Magliaco, uh, Salvatore Tanabi, Frank Maggiuri, Louis Lo Rasso, John Montana, Nino Magadino, Rosario Carlisi, 
Jimmy DeLuca, Samuel uh, Laguta, Dominic D'Agostino, Joe Falcone, Salvatore Falcone, Rosario Mancuso, uh, Casenza Valenti, Frank Valenti, Mike Genovese, Gabriel uh, Manarino, Joida, Dominic Avaletto, John Scalish, John DeMarco, uh, The Cheese Man, Frank Zito, Salvatore uh, Cufari, Santo Traficante, Joe Savello, John Coletti, uh, Jimmy Coletti, Frank D. Simone, Simone Scazzari, Nicholas C- Nick Savella, uh, and Joseph Falardo. And that covers Kansas City, Los Angeles, Dallas, Florida, Springfield, Massachusetts, Illinois, Patriarchas, uh, the Savella, the Cleveland family, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Rochester, Utica, uh, Buffalo, the DeCavalcantes, the Profacis, the Lucchese's, the Gambinos, uh, Genovese, the Bonanos, et cetera, et cetera. And the list is Northeast Pennsylvania. Everybody and their fucking mother was there. How about that? <laughs> so while the mafia could deny its, ex- its existence, uh, with me- with the meeting being front page news, they can no longer play as if they didn't exist. As a result of this bullshit, J. Edgar Hoover, cross dresser, began the top hoodlum program, uh, which would then go after and target top mob bosses in America. Keep in mind, they didn't need to prove it; they just needed to assume it. And that's just the way it operated then. That's the way it fucking operates now. This is the same program that Joe Bonanno and Bill Bonanno's name was redacted from because they were giving up guys for decades. Uh, Because of this meeting, mob books were closed officially. It did not reopen until 1976. As a result, Joe Barber was blamed for the whole entire thing, as was Stefano Magadino. Well, nobody can really blame either one because at the end of the day, the meeting was a huge setup with one conspirator, one conspirator Joe Bonanno, in my opinion. Uh, and Bonanno had a serious beef going on with Stefano Magadino, who was his cousin. Uh, and a lot of that went back to the fact that Magadino fell in line with Luciano and everybody else. Magadino was about the mafia, not about himself. Uh, and Magadino would end up taking the brunt of Sam Giancana's fucking rage, who didn't rage, who didn't even go. And Giancana, in turn, tries to kill Stefano Magadino as a hand grenade was thrown through the window of his home, but it never detonated. Uh, Giancana, in my opinion, had nothing to fucking bitch about, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, but at any at any rate, they were mad because Magadino was held responsible for handling everything that was going on, and he passed the buck. And they put it in the same goddamn fucking place they did the year before. And so, of course, they're going to blame, people are going to get blamed. Uh, so while Vito gets what he wants, there was something on the back end that he couldn't really conceive at the time. Not only did Luciano and Costello want revenge on Vito Genovese, but Gambino also did not trust Vito Genovese at all. He used Genovese to acquire what he wanted as well. Gambino knew that the Appalachian debacle was a fucking disaster, and he also knew that just as he told Vito to use shit against Anastasia, that Gambino could use it against Genovese. Uh, at the end of the day, if it came to it, uh, Luciano had been seething for years, and now was the time to act. Luciano, who was close to Costello, uh, and both were very close to Gambino, ends up getting in touch with Gambino, and he has a plot. They knew that Gambino had issues with his own family, mainly Neil Della Croce and Rava. Uh, They knew that if they could remove Genovese off the streets, that war would pretty much be avoided for Gambino. So for those I keep for those I asked the question to today, this is going to be probably the most accurate answer to that. They knew that if they could take Genovese off the streets, didn't matter whether it was murder, death or jail, that war would be avoided because of what Neil Della Croce and others might fucking do. Uh, Luciano knew that Genovese was getting sloppy in the drug trade, and he knew that that was the way to fuck him in the ass. Uh, Killing him might have probably been the best idea, which we've talked about today, but I think the bigger insult was putting him in prison where he would be left to his own anger and rage and really be just sort of become nobody. And they asked Carlo Gambito to handle it, 
And he says, yeah, I'll do it. Luciano through Meyer, Lansky, and Costello funneled $60,000 to Gambino. Gambino covered the other $40,000, making it even one hundred. dollars Gambino then had his subordinates hire a known Puerto Rican drug dealer to implicate Vito Genovese in a drug deal. Uh, that guy's name was Nelson Cantalops, and he would tell the police that he, in fact, carried out multiple drug deals with Vito Genovese. Genovese would end up being indicted in 1958 and arrested for narcotics importation and distribution he would be found guilty on april 17th of 1959 and would be sentenced to 15 years in federal prison luciano lancy excuse me lansky costello and gambino had pretty much put the menace in the can uh, it facilitated gambino's issue with his own men hell-bent on revenge they were able to avoid war and lucio luciano gets what he wanted and costello gets to feel some sort of joy and retribution genovese knew from day one that it was a setup and he was hell-bent on killing anybody that he thought was even remotely fucking involved in it uh genovese would then attempt to run the family through anthony strollo but he sort of begins to feel that strollo was in fact the snake in the grass and he begins to think that maybe strollo had something to do with setting him up uh and he would be correct in that assumption uh, hellbent on revenge, he ordered the death of Strollo. It wasn't just his betrayal of switching sides, uh, which he likely was promised. You know, probably Gambino said, "Listen, if you go along with us, you help him set a, you help us set him up. You can take over the crime family." I'm sure that's what he told was told, and Gambino probably was never going to let him take over. But he told him what he needed to tell him to get on board. Uh, so. The idea that, that, that maybe Gambino was going to honor anything he might have told Strollo, I just don't think that was the case. But Strollo also had another problem with Genovese because he was skimming the drug operation, and Genovese knew the, mo the big money stopped coming. So on April 8th of 62, Strollo disappears after leaving his house in Fort Lee, New Jersey. He was never found. Murder still unsolved. Uh, according to mob rat Joe Valachi, when he went to visit Genovese in prison, or when he was doing time... Uh, in prison with Genovese in Atlanta, he admitted to having his head chopped off. <laughs> so is <tr> <laughs> What a great conversation. Hey, what'd you get? What'd you get in your canteen? Well, you get some peanut butter. Hey, I chopped the guy's fucking head off. <laughs> uh, at that point, Genovese would install a ru ruling panel. That panel would be Tommy Eboli, uh, Jerry Catania, and uh, Philip Benny Squint Lombardo. Not to be undone, <laughs> back in 1959 genovese had anthony carfano killed uh this was before volacci ended up in prison on narcotics violations uh, carfano was killed because he refused to go to the appalachian meeting <laughs> and the reason why he didn't want to go was because he was mad that genovese tried to kill costello uh it was like pissing on genovese's shoes and he wasn't going to tolerate carfano and a female were shot to death in a car outside of his home in jackson heights where it is joe valachi committed those murders on behalf of vito genovese 1962 1962 valachi uh and genovese ended up doing time in atlanta uh genovese was just absolutely <laughs> I, can you believe, I mean, can you see Vito Genovese foaming at the mouth, screaming he's going to kill everybody? <laughs> and what he does is he loosely accuses Valachi of being a rat. And Valachi gets so terrified uh, that there was an incident in prison and there was another inmate who approached him from behind and Valachi thought that it was somebody sent for by, by Genovese and he ends up piping the guy to fucking death. And that murder uh, ends up getting him life in prison but then after that, Genovese says, wait a minute, why did he react like that if he's done nothing wrong? All right, $100,000 contract on your fucking head. And that's when Joe Valachi runs and becomes a fucking informant. Uh, on October of 1963, Valachi would testify before Arkansas Senator John L. McClellan's Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations of the U.S. Senate Committee on Government Operations, known as the Valachi Hearings, uh, stating that the Italian-American Mafia actually existed, uh, and for the first time, a member had acknowledged its existence in public. Uh, Valachi's testimony was the first major violation of Omerta, breaking his blood oath. 
Uh, he was the first member of the Italian American Mafia to ever acknowledge the existence publicly and was credited with the popularization of the term Cosa Nostra. Although Valachi's disclosures never led directly to the prosecution of anybody, <laughs> he provided many details on the history of the mob, the operations, the rituals, and aided in the solution of several unsolved murders and named many members in, of major crime families. The trial exposed the American organized crime to the world through Valachi's bullshit. Uh, Valachi was a disaster for the fucking mafia, uh, and he gave the government everything. Uh, the structure, the induction, the bosses, I mean everything. So, that's just what Valachi would end up going and doing. So, in August of 19, I think it was August 24th of 1964, Genovese is still shit and tax, still angry. Uh, and he's still angry over the Baccia murder, which we talked about last week. Remember, it was the Baccia murder that ended up getting him indicted, which is why he took off to fucking Italy. He's already pissed at Luciano and Gambino, killing half his fucking men, and now he's he's obsessing about Ernest Rapolo, who was the guy who basically ratted him out for that murder, which got him indicted. And it's worth noting that that indictment, which we talked about last week, that murder, that murder charge was dropped. You would think he'd let it go. Not Vito. <laughs> He's not going to let a fucking thing go. Uh, and Ernest Rapolo's body ends up getting recovered in Jamaica Bay, Queens. The killers had attached two concrete blocks to his legs uh, and uh, and blocks that were tied to his hands. And by all accounts, Genovese was gleeful in prison and dancing after hearing. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Genovese would, do, like I said, try to keep control of the family. But his health would begin to deteriorate. Uh, he would end up getting moved to USP Missouri, which was a medical ward, and he would pass away of a massive heart attack on Valentine's Day of all days, 1969. Uh, Vito Genovese, you know, as much as I laugh about some of the shit he did, <laughs> he lived by his own set of rules. He followed them when he wanted and expected everybody else to follow them or else. He played people against one another. He took a shot. And he got what he wanted. However, he forgot the backstabbing and the treachery that he committed against many of his friends and contemporaries would come back to haunt him. Vito, in the end, was a lot of things. He was powerful. He earned a lot of money. He was fucking dangerous. He was a nutty fuck. He was highly intelligent. But he played his cards in a way where he showed his hand way too often. When you become... What's the word I'm looking for? Um... When people know what you're going to do before you do it, your tell. He had a horrible tell. Uh, and Genovese is important to the history of the mafia. Uh, especially in his early days, he truly was one of the guys. But what he became is not how he began. He's still a gangster, still a serious guy. But he allowed his ego and his need for power and recognition and revenge to outweigh everything else. And that's what hurts him in the end. Did Luciano get the last laugh? Absolutely, he did. Uh, Genovese took Luci Luciano out of the rackets and he took him out of the life. But Luciano had the last word. And that's where we're at. And that's what happened to Vito Genovese. So, when we come back next week, who's going to step over and take over the crime family now? Is Luciano totally done? Is he out? Who's going to step up and take over now that Genovese is gone? And that's where we're going to begin our show next week. So, I wanted to thank everybody for being patient enough <laughs> to listen to this long-ass fucking show and to listen to my diatribes. And for all the new people, welcome to the show. I appreciate all my listeners. Even the ones who cancel on me. I appreciate you all. So, next week.